We've spent some time on key management of how to get secrets between entities. So we know the basics now for most uh, for applying cryptography to, to secure communications and secure uh, data. For example, from the start of the semester, we've gone through uh, different approaches for encryption. So really, we've seen symmetric key encryption and some different algorithms. So both sides use the same key. Then we went to public key encryption, where we have a public and a private key and a key pair. And we can use it in two ways. We encrypt with a public key of the receiver for confidentiality. We encrypt with a private key of the sender for authentication, to sign something. And the topic on the previous topic on key distribution was about, well, how do we get keys to do this encryption? And we saw some different approaches. So the challenge is really get a secret key to the other side. In practice, we usually use symmetric key encryption to encrypt data because it's much faster than public key encryption. But we can use public key encryption to encrypt just a small amount and to sign things. So encrypting a small amount may be encrypting a secret key that we then use for symmetric key encryption. And we arrived at digital certificates is a common way in internet-based systems to, to distribute public keys. I need to know someone's public key. If someone just sends it to me, I don't trust if it's from them or someone else. The way that we do that is we get someone else to, to sign that public key. As long as I trust them, then that follows that I, entrust, I trust the public key I receive. We'll see some more examples of digital certificates when we look at web security, which is what we lead to here, transport level security. Or more generally, some, really this topic is some examples of using some of the cryptographic techniques for internet-based security. Transport level means at the transport layer in, in our network stack. So the transport layer, we'll see that uh, we use some security mechanisms to encrypt application traffic. And one example we'll spend some time on is web-based uh, applications, so web security issues. And we'll see that to the main way to encrypt web traffic is using something called TLS or SSL, so we'll go through that today. In fact, HTTPS is really just normal HTTP using those two previous protocols, TLS or SSL. And maybe next week we'll look at Secure Shell not for web browsing, but to remotely accessing computers. Because you use it a lot, or you've used it in labs and, uh, and uh, other tasks, we will see how it works, uh, how it encrypts data. But generally about web security or, or even internet security, most of the protocols which were developed for the internet were developed in the day when everyone trusted everyone. That is, that it was just a few universities and organizations connecting networks together. They knew each other. There was no need for security mechanisms. There was no need to encrypt and authenticate. Therefore, a lot of the internet protocols that we still use were developed with no security in mind. There's no encryption inside TCP or IP. Even HTTP has no security mechanisms built in. But as, of course, as the internet grew and people used it for, for uh, commercial transactions, uh, different things, there's a need for security. So really extensions were developed of the existing protocols to support the security mechanisms. So things to allow us to authenticate clients and servers, to make sure we're talking with the right entity, and to encrypt our traffic across the internet. There are different approaches for doing it. And essentially, the approaches for providing encryption or security, uh, you can choose between the different layers in the stack as to where to implement that security. And people have come up with different solutions. Uh, at the network layer, we have IP. And there's an extension to IP called IPsec, IP security. 
that allows for encrypting the IP packets and providing authentication. It's not widely used uh, by end users. It's sometimes used in VPNs, virtual private networks. For transport layer, that is TCP especially, to encrypt TCP traffic, there's an extension called Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. And eventually it was uh, replaced or renamed to be Transport Layer Security, TLS. So we'll talk about them. But if you don't use IPsec or SSL, you may implement the security mechanisms in your own application. Maybe you create your own application for remote, remote login, so implement the encryption with that. And for example, Secure Shell is one example there. Email has its own security mechanisms built in, or not built in, but uh, that you can add on. So you can either do security in the internet at the application layer, at the transport layer, or at the network layer. We will go through at the transport layer, mainly, with maybe a short example about the application layer with Secure Shell at the end. In web-based communications and, and generally in the internet, there are many threats, many things that can go wrong and, and the reasons why we need security mechanisms. People can uh, modify our data, they can listen to what we're, we're sending, they can uh, uh, intercept our packets, or they can issue or make our servers fail, so denial of service attacks, they can impersonate other people or forge data. They are the threats, and there are many consequences of those threats. The countermeasures, the mechanisms we have to try and stop those threats uh, turning into attacks, include things like uh, what we say here, cryptographic checksums, hash functions, MAC functions, encryption for confidentiality, proxies, tunnels, VPNs, Tor for confidentiality or anonymous browsing, denial of service, hard to prevent denial of service attacks, so they, uh, it's difficult there to de have cryptographic mechanisms to prevent them, authentication using the techniques we've talked about, public key cryptography, digital certificates. So again, there are different ways to implement security in the internet, really we can differentiate between the network layer security, user IPsec, it encrypts or secures IP datagrams, transport layer security, SSL, it provides security for TCP packets, or application specific security at the application layer, it's only for individual applications that we implement security. So. We'll only go through mainly secure, uh, transport layer security, but the advantages or the differences really are uh, the lower the layer that we implement that security mechanism, the more widely it can be applied to all of our data. For example, application-specific security is only for that individual application. Email, for example. The email security mechanisms, of course, don't protect our web browsing. Transport layer security usually applies just to TCP. So it only works for TCP-based applications. Non-TCP applications cannot use SSL or TLS. There are other, other mechanisms. In practice, it's turned out that the most widely used are the, the last two, transport layer security and application-specific mechanisms. IPsec is, is used, but maybe not as widely as, as the others. So we'll focus on them. So let's look at transport layer security, and we'll look at it from the perspective of web browsing. But in fact, transport layer security can be used for other applications. It can be used for any application that uses TCP. Email uses TCP, web browsing uses TCP, secure shell does, or remote login. Uh, database applications use TCP. Many applications use TCP. Normally when they send data across the internet, it's unencrypted. SSL, 
adds that encryption to the data sent using TCP. IPsec adds even more, but for the IP packet. Okay, so we can combine them. We can encrypt the TCP segments and then encrypt again the IP datagrams. It has the disadvantage of that extra level of encryption of the performance. Uh, but if we use IPsec, it works for U UDP and TCP. It doesn't matter if your application is sending UDP packets or TCP packets. IPsec applies to both. So there's the advantage of IPsec. There are some other differences in terms of the, how widely available they are and how easy to use they are. IPsec generally requires a, uh, some setup by the administrator or by the user of the computer, whereas SSL, it's, it's transparent to the user. The user doesn't have to do much to, to use it. It's automatic. That's why maybe SSL has become more widely used. You've used OpenSSL as a piece of software. OpenSSL is really was implemented as a library to implement Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. So we'll see that as we go through. So what is it? SSL and TLS. So when there was a, a, a strong need for security in web-based communications, the normal way that your application uses TCP is a concept called sockets. You write your program and because TCP is in the operating system, what the application develop, developer does is they use an API to call TCP to send packets and set up a connection. And that API is called the sockets API. And Netscape, the organization that, uh, or, or the, the, the web browser and the people who developed it, wanted to add some encryption for communications between the web browser and web servers. So what they did is they ex developed a, uh, a layer that goes between TCP and your application that does the encryption for you. So it still uses TCP and still uses the normal application, but it introduces the, the security mechanism. So it was referred to as the secure sockets layer. Before that, we just used sockets, but if you want a secure connection, you use secure sockets, SSL. SSL went through different versions, so version 1, version 2. SSL version 3 is, uh, was developed by Netscape, the organization, but then the standards organization, ITF, created an equivalent standard which was called Transport Layer Security, the more general name, TLS. So SSL version 3 and I think TLS version 1 are effectively the same. So that's why sometimes, and especially in this course, we'll use both names to refer to the same thing. SSL or TLS are commonly used to refer to the same thing. So we'll, we'll use the old name sometimes, sometimes we'll use the new name. But there are different versions. So SSL version 1 is different than TLS version 1.2. So it becomes more complex when you look at the individual versions. But for this course, when I say SSL, I also mean TLS and vice versa. What it does is it provides security services to the application layer that uses TCP. And Maybe we, before we look at the, the more detailed picture, we'll draw our own. Normally, our applications, say a web browser, a web browser, when it creates a packet, the web browser implements the application layer protocol, HTTP. And the normal operation is that when a HTTP request is created, it's sent to TCP, 
which is then sent to IP, an IP datagram is created, and then the network interface card sends it across the, the network. That's the flow of, of the packet. This is your application, the browser and HTTP. This is your operating system in your computer, and this is the hardware, the network interface card. So a simple view of what happens when your web browser creates a request for a web page. The graphical user interface allows you to click on the link. The browser implements HTTP. It creates the GET request. That is sent to the operating system. In particular, TCP inside the operating system takes the GET request, sets up a TCP connection using IP and, and so it creates a TCP segment, an IP datagram, and sends it using the network interface card across the network. Eventually it's received by the web server and, and replies come back. So that's the layering, for example, for web browsing. This, the, the API, the programming interface that the person who develops the web browser uses to talk to the operating system is referred to as sockets. Have you learned sockets? Maybe with Dr. Comwood? Maybe not. You may see it in some... Uh, if you develop network-based applications, you'll need to use sockets. Just the terminology that we're coming across. Now, nothing's encrypted here. So the idea of using TLS is that we'd like to use introducing encryption of our application data. So we have our browser, HTTP, and then we have this intermediate layer called, I'll call it SSL. and then TCP, IP, and the network interface card. So the layering, when we use SSL, we still have our operating system, our, our network hardware, and the application here. But the application normally uses just HTTP, but then it uses the secure sockets layer. And the secure sockets layer may be implemented in your, in your browser or a library provided by your, your operating system. An example here, an example implementation that you know of is OpenSSL. OpenSSL provides a set of uh, C functions that you can call from your application that does the encryption, it implements AES, it implements RSA and all the other cryptographic mechanisms. So from a layering perspective, SSL, we introduce a layer between application and transport. And what happens is that when you create the HTTP GET request, before it's sent to TCP, it's encrypted using SSL. And then the encrypted information is sent to TCP and sent across the internet. And it not only encrypts, it also provides the authentication techniques. So what we're going to do is look at what SSL does and how it's structured. Anyone know any other libraries apart from OpenSSL? Has anyone done any development on other systems? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, there are, there are, are, are others. Windows has... Uh, yeah, I don't remember the name either. Windows has one. It's called... Uh, not PowerShell. Um, the, the Windows sockets layer was called WinSock. The security layer... I forget the name now. Secure something it was. Secure something. I'll look up the name for Windows, but it's equivalent to what OpenSSL does. It allows you, the application programmer, to call their implementation of uh, the encryption operations. Um, 
Mac uses OpenSSL in some cases. Uh, Netscape or, or Firefox has a separate library, I think generally referred as NSS. Uh, or was it? Um, and there are a couple of other libraries that applications may use. So rather than the application developer, no. Uh, PGP is different, not so commonly here. But there is uh, uh, a couple of variations, but not really a replacement. So the idea of these libraries is that they implement AES, RSA, and all the encryption mechani mechanisms we need. You, as the application developer, don't need to implement them. You just use the library. You develop your application that makes use of that library. We may return to them after we go through uh, some examples. And I'll look up the name of the Windows one. So SSL is actually broken up into two sub-layers. So we have IP and TCP. This is, these two layers are part of SSL. And above that, not shown in this diagram, is the application layer. We will use HTTP as the example of the application, but other applications can be used as well. It's, it's not dependent upon the application. Oh, HTTP is here. Okay. So there are four parts of SSL. There's what's called the SSL record protocol. This is the thing that encrypts the data and provides message integrity. Message integrity is checking, so the receiver checking that nothing's being modified. For example, it uses a, a MAC function. When we send data, the record protocol will encrypt that data before it's sent and attach a MAC so that the receiver can verify that nothing's being modified. So that's the record protocol. But before we can encrypt data, we must exchange keys. We must uh, communicate with the other side, exchange keys, and agree upon parameters. So there's a handshake protocol to do that. So before we send any encrypted data between client and server, we do a handshake between client and server. We exchange some messages and agree upon how we're going to encrypt. So there's the handshake protocol to do that. It uh, negotiates the algorithms to use, the keys to use, and other parameters that are necessary. SSL allows you to use different ciphers, to use different algorithms to encrypt. And during the initial stage, it uses usually some public key algorithms. But then to encrypt the data, it uses a symmetric key algorithm. And in fact, during the connection, you can ch change ciphers. So there's a way, or there's a simple mechanism, which is called the change cipher spec, which says, OK, we were using that cipher. Now let's change to the new one. And we'll see that in, in some of the examples. The fourth part is an alert protocol, which is a way for the two entities to send special messages to each other, maybe about the status, any warnings or errors that have happened. For example, I receive a packet that doesn't pass the integrity check, the MAC fails. Then the alert protocol can be used to send a message back to the client saying, I just received a packet and there was an error with that. Do something about it. status updates, warnings, and errors used with the alert protocol. We will, we will use an example for web browsing to illustrate those protocols in, in operation. But before we get to that, let's mention some concepts. SSL has a concept of a connection and a session. TCP has connections only. How do we set up a TCP connection? What's the process we use to set up a TCP connection? What's the name? Three-way handshake, sometimes we call it. The SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK, a TCP connection. Remember with TCP, we do that exchange of three messages, and then we send data. When we're finished, we finish the connection with a FIN message. So TCP has a concept of a connection. So does SSL, and they match. 
So you can think every TCP connection corresponds to an SSL connection. But in addition, SSL has sessions. And we can think a session may contain multiple connections. The idea is that between a client and a server, we establish an SSL session, agreeing upon some algorithms and some parameters. And maybe we use that for the next five minutes. And for every TCP connection that we create between that same browser or same application client and server, we may do so within that session and we use the same algorithms and the same parameters. So the idea is we negotiate a session at the start, and then we may have multiple connections within that session. The idea is that uh, setting up a session takes some effort. We don't want to do it too often. It involves sending uh, multiple packets and it requires some time. So the idea is you create one session between client and server and that can contain multiple connections. So we'll see that in process through our example. Both the client and server store information about those sessions and connections when they're in progress. We'll see some examples. For example, uh, the session may store the certificate being used, the secrets, and for a connection, maybe we have some random values, some nonces, some different keys to encrypt, and some Macs, and so on. We'll see some examples of mention them when we see a specific case. The record protocol is the thing that encrypts the data. And the process, in general, is that the application creates data. For example, a HTTP GET request. SSL then breaks it into fragments. So if our GET request uh, or our data is 5,000 bytes, SSL may break that into smaller fragments, and that will define some limits on, on the size of those fragments. Each fragment may be optionally compressed. We don't have to, but we may compress it to save uh, communication costs. We attach a MAC. Remember, a message authentication code is calculated on the data and using a key. Remember, a MAC function, the MAC, using some secret key of the data, returns some short uh, MAC value or tag. It's a similar purpose as a hash function. We'll use it at the receiver to verify that the data hasn't been modified. So we calculate a MAC and attach that. Then we encrypt all of that, using our, our encryption algorithm. Then we attach a header called the record header, and that fragment is sent using TCP across the internet. And we do that for each fragment that comes from the application data. So let's have a look at an example, and uh, we'll see some of those packets, and then we'll go through not just the record protocol, but the, the handshake that happens before we can encrypt any data. And the example we'll use is for secure web browsing, HTTPS. So normally when we access a website, for example, then the URL, HTTP, this will use HTTP as the application layer protocol and TCP as the transport protocol, sends a request to the server and the server gets the web page in response. There's no security mechanisms used there. To use secure sockets layer, Rather than HTTP, we use what? HTTPS. Okay, I think you use this on a regular basis or you've seen it. 
that tells my browser, don't just use HTTP, but use HTTP combined with the secure sockets layer. That's what the, the secure version of HTTP is. HTTPS is not really another protocol. It is just say, use the normal HTTP, a GET request, receive the response, but use the secure sockets layer to encrypt everything. And we get the same web page back. And if we observe the packets which are sent in this case, we'll see that SSL is used, or, or more precisely TLS, is used to exchange those packets. So I have, I have captured this. I've actually captured it before. And we'll see those packets and see what happens from when I press Enter until I get the web page come back. When I use normal HTTP, no S, how would we draw the packets that are sent? Let's quickly draw what would be sent with normal HTTP without looking at the capture. With normal HTTP, we, to connect to a web server, we first establish a connection with TCP. This is the TCP connection establishment procedure, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. That connects from our browser to server. And then we send the HTTP GET request. There may be a TCP act that comes back. It depends on the, the scenario. And eventually the, the response in a simple case. Maybe a final act. An odd I will not draw it, but we may later close the connection with TCP using the fin messages. So this is just a reminder what you already know of. When we use TCP, we set up a connection with SYN, SYNAC, ACK. With TCP data, it can be sent after the ACK. So here the green packet is actually TCP data. What is the data? It's a HTTP GET request. It's received by the web server, and TCP may send an act saying thank you for the data, and eventually the web server sends some data back. The data in this case is the response, say the web page. There may be a final TCP act saying thank you for the data, and later we may close the connection. The closing is usually a fin and, and an act that comes back from both directions. That's from the TCP perspective. So that's using HTTP with a browser to server. We want to see what happens when we use HTTPS. 
more precisely, using HTTP over SSL. Any questions on the TCP operation or on normal HTTP? Because you need to be aware of that to see what happens with HTTPS. You know all this from, from your other courses. This is not about the security aspect, HTTP. So now let's look, and I'll look at the capture of what happened when I accessed ICT server using HTTPS, and we'll learn the packets being sent. And this is the, the sequence of packets when we used HTTPS. I'll zoom in a moment and, and look at some selected packets, but first I'll describe the setup. So what I did is I visited the ICT website using HTTPS in, in the URL, and that triggered my browser, and my, the IP address of my browser computer is this 192.168.1.7 address. It triggered to contact the ICT server. And the ICT server internally inside SIT has the address 10.10.10.6. Okay, so those two addresses, dot seven is browser, dot six, the 10 address is the server, the ICT server specifically. The first thing we see, uh, actually we can hide the, the time for a moment. This, before I hide the time, this took uh, about 116 milliseconds from the start until the end. In fact, most likely to get the data, to get the web page, maybe slightly less, maybe 76 milliseconds for, from when I pressed enter to visit the link, it triggered the first SYN message to be sent, and eventually I get the web page back, we'll see where, and it takes about 75, 76 milliseconds in that case. But that's locally inside SIT. So I'll hide the time and zoom in a bit. So the first three messages are the normal TCP connection setup. Sin, Sinac, Ack. So there's nothing new here. That's the same as what happens in every TCP connection. Browser sends a TCP Sin, server sends back Sinac, and then the final Ack. Any questions on this, the three-way handshake for TCP? In fact, so that happened. We'll draw it shortly. Uh, one thing before we hide these messages, what port numbers are used? And I'll make it easier for you. What port numbers are used? Four four three is the port number of the server. We know with HTTP the port number of the server is eighty. But here, when we use HTTPS, the port number used by a web server is different. It's 443. So we see up here the destination port of that first packet. It's sent from some random or dynamic port on my web browser, 33536, but going to HTTPS server 443. So that's one difference between secure web servers and normal. HTTP web servers, they listen on different port numbers. The result is that one computer usually will run both. It will run a web server that can listen for normal HTTP but also for HTTPS. The protocol used for, so we see TCP, this was actually using TLS version 1. So one, I think, or maybe one point something, but TLS version 1.2. Okay, so there are different versions of 
SSL and TLS. This is using specifically TLS version 1.2, but I may just refer to it as the old name of SSL. So let's filter out these TCP packets, the SINs. These are just TCP acts. This message is TCP data. We'll look at the content shortly, but from TCP perspective, set up a connection, send some data, get an ACK. Send some data, get an ACK, and so on. So I'm going to hide these ACKs because they're just at the, the transport layer level. They're not part of SSL. So filter and display just SSL packets, and we're left with these packets. So these are the SSL messages which are sent between client and server. So we want to look at what happens here and, and see how SSL works. Who sends the first packet? Browser or server? OK, be aware. The 192 address is the browser. The 1010 address is the server. So the browser contacts the server. The browser is the client, so the client and server. And the first message is hello. I'm a client. I want to talk to you. So it's called a client hello message. This is part of the initial handshake, this SSL handshake, not the TCP handshake. So once the connection is set up, they must tell each other they want to communicate, or the client must contact the server and then agree upon some parameters. So the first thing is a client hello message. Some of the, this sequence, it won't be exactly the same, but on the lecture notes, and we'll draw it as well, but if we go through, we'll see more general sequences shown on this slide, the hello and so on. But the example we will see is slightly different. It's a specific case. What's inside this client hello message? If we expand here, what do we see? It's a hello message. And we'll not look at every field, but the, the important things, first it contains some random bytes. They're going to be useful later. So the client says hello to the server, and inside this message it sends some random data. And it's going to use those random bytes, those, those numbers, uh, in some of the steps later. It's like a nonce value. In some of the protocols we've talked about, we set a nonce, N1, N2. This is like a nonce value being sent from client to server. It's actually 28 bytes. It's generated. The other important thing is this list of ciphers. And there's 11 in the list. This is the client saying to the server, for our secure connection, I propose that we use one of these 11 sets of ciphers, sets of algorithms. Because with a secure connection, we don't, don't just use one algorithm to encrypt everything. We will generally use some algorithms to do key exchange and authentication, and then different algorithms to do the data encryption. And what the client is saying, I propose to use this one, this combination. We'll go through it in a moment. Or if you don't want that, this is my second preference, my third preference, and my 11th preference. So the client indicates what algorithms it prefers to use. We'll see when the server responds, it will select one of them. What do all these characters mean in the first case? Actually, we'll choose one which uh, maybe is easier to explain first. And we'll come back to the others. This one is saying that uh, all right, TLS is being used, RSA. So for public key encryption, we'll use RSA. And we'll use an RSA public key and a certificate using RSA to encrypt a secret value. Remember the general approach to exchange a secret, encrypt with public key encryption. And to authenticate, use 
uh, public, public keys and certificates. So the public key algorithm in this case would be RSA. For data encryption, use a symmetric key algorithm. Which algorithm? AES. AES supports different key lengths, so AES with a 128-bit key, and the mode of operation, CBC. And the third algorithm, we use some hash functions in, in some of the steps. Which hash function in this case? SHA. So that's the way to interpret this. It's really three, three sets of algorithms. The public key algorithm, RSA, the data encryption, symmetric key, AES128 with CBC, and the hash algorithm, SHA. But there are some variations. For example, this one allows for AES with 256-bit key. This one still uses SHA AES, but it combines RSA with Diffie-Hellman. Remember Diffie-Hellman? We have those global public parameters, alpha and Q, and it's about solving discrete logarithms. So this Diffie-Hellman's also a public key algorithm. The way that we use this is that we'll use Diffie-Hellman to exchange a secret. Both sides know a secret. We'll use RSA for the certificate, for the public key to authenticate the server. I think in the example we'll see this one gets chosen. Of the 11, that one gets chosen. DH is for Diffie-Hellman. E for ephemeral. I can't say it. We'll, we'll show, it, show, it, show it shortly. The other ones are a slight variance. This one's Diffie-Hellman with RSA with AS, but EC is a variant of Diffie-Hellman. We studied Diffie-Hellman where it was about solving discrete logarithms. It was uh, what a to the power of x mod, mod n. There's a variation of that which uses slightly different problems of, of about curves and finding points on the curve. It's called elliptic curve cryptography. And EC refers to elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, a variation of the algorithm. We haven't talked about elliptic curve cryptography, uh, but just think of it as a, a different way to exchange secrets. So different combinations proposed by the client. The client can also choose to use compression. Which compression methods do you think it would choose? It chooses one. Anyone want to guess before I show you? Compression methods, do you know any? Zip is one algorithm, uh, so there are different compression algorithms. The default is none or null. Okay, so here it says don't use compression. If we wanted to use compression, we'd add uh, in the list and say zip or gzip or some other algorithm that we'd would like to compress with. And there is some other information. Uh, some of these suggested algorithms require different parameters and they are listed in these extended values. But uh, at this stage, not important for us. Client says hello. Server receives a hello and sends back a hello message from the server. So let's look at that. And in some of these packets, there are in fact two messages included. Again, here we'll see that from SSL's perspective, this one packet contains two messages, the server hello and the certificate. So we'll, we'll treat them separately, explain them separately. The server hello, if we find it, is this part. It in also includes some random numbers that the server chose. And importantly, it selects one of those 11 that the client uh, preferred. It would normally choose the, the highest one in the list that the server also supports. So in this case, the server has chosen Diffie-Hellman with RSA, with AES, with SHA. Of those 11, it chooses one. If the server doesn't support any of them, it will, will, will not allow a connection. So the server and client must support some common uh, combinations there. 
And the rest, I think, is not so important just yet. We may return. So let's make note of what's happened so far and, and, and list these algorithms that we're going to use. Diffie-Hellman, RSA, AES, and SHA. This is the same as the previous TCP connection setup. Nothing changed. But then we send a cl client hello message. And two things that we've seen in that hello message from the client, the browser is the client, is that it contains many things, but the two things that we'll see later is it contains some random bytes, so it's a, ran a random value, and the preferred ciphers, a list of preferred ciphers that it will use. When the server gets that, there's in fact a TCP ACK that comes back. I'm not going to draw that, but there is a TCP ACK uh, involved, just to save space. We'll just draw the next message that comes back is a hello message from the server. It also contains some random bytes and the selected cipher or, or combination of ciphers. I say that the selected cipher set. It, it's not just a single algorithm, it's a, a set of algorithms. And let's just list that algorithm that was selected and, and explain how it's going to be used. It was Diffie-Hellman, RSA, AES and SHA. Diffie Hellman Ephemerial. Diffie Hellman, we know. It's the algorithm for sharing a secret. Remember, we uh, have a public alpha and queue, 
We choose some x, calculate y, send y to the other side. They choose x, calculate a y, send it back, and from that we both get the same key k. That was Diffie-Hellman. Ephemeral here simply means uh, temporary. There's a different version which is fixed, which means that so the purpose here is that we'll use Diffie-Hellman to exchange a secret and we'll only use that secret temporarily for a short time. We will not continue to use it. Later, if we want to uh, communi communicate again, we'll exchange and get a new secret. So the idea here is that we only use the secret key for a short period. There is a, a variant called Diffie-Hellman fixed, which will use the same secret for a longer period. The purpose of this is secret key exchange. That's why we use Diffie-Hellman here. Other algorithm, RSA, we know what that means. The purpose of RSA is authentication of the server in this case. If we remember back to Diffie-Hellman, we went through a case of a man in the middle attack is possible. I don't have it, but if you look back through your notes, when we did Diffie-Hellman, we saw that if there was some in the, in the middle, with the normal Diffie-Hellman, they could uh, pretend to be both entities, the, the receiver and the sender, and trick the two entities into believing they have a secret when the man in the middle also knows that secret. It's the same type of attack we saw on RSA. So a man in the middle attack we saw in key distribution. It's possible. So the problem with the, or the reason because of the, the reason for the man in the middle attack is because the receiver doesn't know that the public values it got are correct. The way to avoid the man in the middle attack is to use a certificate. To have someone sign those public values. And that's why we use RSA here. We use RSA for the certificate, the authentication of those uh, values. We'll see an RSA certificate. certificate. So what will happen is that a certificate is sent from server to client and that will allow the client to verify the public values that it got for the Diffie-Hellman to be sure there's no man in the middle attack. Both Diffie-Hellman and RSA are public key algorithms. We're using one for secret key exchange and the other one to authenticate that step. And we also use this certificate to, so that's to make sure that we are communicating with the correct server. The other algorithms that we listed. What was it? AES one two eight CBC. Purpose, so we know the algorithm, the mode of operation, the key length, and AES data encryption. All the data, once we've set up a connection, is encrypted using AES. The key that we use is obtained based upon the key we exchange with Diffie-Hellman. So we'll use Diffie-Hellman, get a secret, we'll use RSA to verify that th that worked correctly, then we'll use that secret to uh, do the encryption. The last thing, some of those steps require a hash function or, or a MAC function in particular. Uh, we use SHA, a hash algorithm, 
and that is used, uh, that's actually used with HMAC. for data integrity. That is, we for our MAC function. HMAC takes a hash function, SHA, and turns it into a MAC function. So they all use HMAC, and we specify which hash function. Remember the difference between a, a MAC and a hash? Hash takes just some data, a Mac takes a key and data. In SSL, we use a Mac on everything we, we're going to send. We take some data and we use a key. What algorithm do we use for the Mac? We, it's HMAC combined with SHA. So that's what we'll use for the different security mechanisms in this HTTPS uh, web browsing exchange. So in fact it's com combining everything we've learned across the semester, symmetric key encryption, public key, key exchange and, and authentication or data integrity. This second message, this second message in the exchange, the one from server to client, actually contains two handshake messages. We're still in the handshake phase before we can encrypt data. The server saying hello and saying what algorithms we'll use. And since we've chosen the algorithms that we'll use RSA for a certificate, it includes the certificate here. What do we expect to hit, see here in this 1100 bytes? The certificate of who? of the web server, of ICT. It's included in this message. And you could see and look through all the fields, the signed certificate. So this is an X509 certificate. We've looked at them in the previous topic. We have the issuer, and you can expand and see all the data, the subject, the, the timestamp of how long it's valid for and so on. So this is the actual certificate included in the message. And it's an RSA public key is included, the public key info. There's the subject's public key, which would be some uh, modulus N and some public value E. That's the RSA key. And signed. And in this case, signed by who? ICT web server, the si certificate is signed by who? It's actually a self-signed certificate. ICT, it's issued to the ICT web server, the common name is that of the, the domain name of the server, and it's issued by the, actually the same person. It's a self-signed certificate. Uh, I updated it today just for this demo. It expired two weeks ago. Okay. So now we have the certificate. Let's see what comes next. The next message is in fact also from server to client. No, this is from server to client. Server key exchange. Remember we're going to use Diffie-Hellman now to exchange a secret. How do we do Diffie-Hellman? Well, the server chooses some public values, calculates its value of Y and sends it to the other side. And it's sent in this message. The server key exchange is not so interesting to look at because it's all signed. It's actually uh, 
500 bytes of important information in here. It includes the Diffie-Hellman public values, alpha and Q, and the Y value of the server, all signed with the RSA key. So let's draw that to finish today. The next message certificate. They were actually included in the same packet, but from the SSL perspective, they're two different messages. That was the certificate of the web server. And then we had the key exchange. Server key exchange, it was called. Inside that, for Diffie-Hellman, the parameters, there's an alpha, some modulus Q, and some public value, Y of the server. The server also has its private value, XS. It sends that to the client. When the client gets it, from those public values, it can calculate or it would choose its x value and calculate its x, uh, its y for the client and send it back. Then they find a calculated shared secret key using Diffie-Hellman. Importantly, that information so that we can't have a man in the middle attack, that information in the Diffie-Hellman, uh, especially the Y value, is signed using the public key of the server, the RSA public key, which was included in the certificate. So, sorry, it's not signed with a public key, it's signed with the private key. Private key of the server. The server signs it, and that means that the client can verify that these are the right values. They did, in fact, come from the server. The way that it verifies is because it knows the public key in the certificate. And it knows it has the right public key because that certificate is signed by an authority that the browser trusts. In this case, it's self-signed, so we actually have to click on that warning message to confirm that we accept it. That clock is wrong, so don't worry. We have five more minutes. No, we're finished today. We'll continue that on Tuesday. Uh, make sure you do the quiz, which covers those aspects of key management, including certificates. And we'll finish this exchange on Tuesday. And then I think Friday next week, a little bit about Secure Shell, and that should finish us for the semester.